All right, our last uh, speaker of this section is Ken Schwartz. Uh, Ken was recently elected to the Board of Directors of the Vertical Flight Society, and he's been a driving force behind the Society's EV Toll News Initiative since early 2017 and is a contributing editor of VertiFlight Magazine. He has over 25 years of experience as a senior aerospace marketing and communications strategist with major commercial aircraft manufacturers, special mission helicopter operators, regional airlines, and flight training and simulation companies. Ken previously worked as a senior market analyst at Bombardier, developing billion dollar marketing campaigns for the CRJ regional jet and Q series Dash 8 airlines and managed large fleets of Soviet and Western helicopters supporting UN peacekeeping forces. He's also been a freelance aviation photojournalist since the late 70s and has covered the helicopter, airline, and aircraft manufacturing industry since the late 70s. In 2010, Ken won the Helicopter Association International's Communicator of the Year Award. He's published thousands of articles on vertical flight and commercial aviation and co-authored histories of Pratt & Whitney Canada, CAE, Bell Helicopter Textron Canada, and Airbus Helicopters Canada. Please welcome Ken. Thanks very much. Um, I've spoken the last two years at this conference and the previous um, uh, sessions I've represented the Vertical Flight Society and I've uh, given a presentation on behalf of my Kirschberg. This time I'm going to draw more on my own aviation background working in both the helicopter industry and the regional airline industry uh, plus writing for aviation magazines for the last uh, 30 odd years. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess the question is uh, market opportunities for emerging technologies. That's what I'm going to focus on. But I'm going to be looking at the future, but also trying to ground my presentation on the past, what I've seen in my own experience, my own professional experience in the industry. There you go. So one of the questions is, will electric aircraft elect replace existing aircraft, or are they going to be cre creating a completely new market segment? If you're in the traditional aviation industry, a lot of what you do is focused on replacement market. You're developing an aircraft that has better DOCs, better fuel efficiency, uh, maybe more seat capacity than the aircraft that are out there before. And you see airlines and commercial operators roll over their fleets as new technology comes available. Um, when we look at the electric uh, aviation market, we're largely talking short haul. We're talking short haul in terms of fixed wing, uh, we're talking short haul in terms of vertical flight. In some cases, we're talking about a compound aircraft that has both the attributes of a fixed wing aircraft and a helicopter. So the question is, if we look at that short haul segment today, it's really regional airlines and the helicopter industry. And what can we see in those markets and how they've evolved? And are there gaps that the electric aircraft can serve better? And then the other question is, what's the relationship between these aircraft and the existing infrastructure? Is new infrastructure required to facilitate this boom? And then the bigger question, when we have a new market segment, how do we forecast the demand? How do we produce something credible that you can take to a bank? So if we look at the regional airline industry in the US and around the world, we really uh, see the evolution from uh, the original trunk carriers that were funded by airmail subsidies in the 20s and 30s and then the market opened up after the Second World War to secondary carriers in a regulated envir environment and then in the 1960s we had the third level of airline industry uh, uh, come into being as the air taxi operators were authorized to fly uh, short haul services and we see that as really the beginning of the commuter airline boom and when we see commuter airlines developing in that early phase we really see uh, a couple different business models there's the business model where they're serving a demand that is created by geographic constraints we have carriers that are flying over water PBA is flying from Boston to, to Cape Cod we have uh, which is now the Cape Air routes we have airlines flying to Catalina Island. We have airlines serving the island chains in Alaska. Um, and so we have those routes and we have uh, chalks flying out of Miami Harbor to the Bahamas. We have these routes and in some cases the routes perpetuate through ownership and through various carriers. And then we have the commuter airlines and the short haul where they're pulling people off the highway. Um, 
uh, Hagerstown to Washington um, with uh, Dick, um, uh, the name has just escaped me, in terms of the early commuters where they're pulling people off the road and they're, they're take, going into uh, Piston Aircraft and into Twin Otters and Beach 99s and gradually moving up the food chain and getting into larger aircraft. And then we have the evolution into code sharing where the airlines become an extension of the mainline carriers. And then we start to see market disruption when when I was at Bombardier, we introduced the regional jet. And what happens over this period in terms of fixed wing is the distances get pushed out further and the seat capacities gradually go up um, in the fleets. So the average seat count goes up every couple of years. Um, we also see regulatory changes. And what we've seen recently in terms of the regional airline industry is that the retirement of smaller aircraft, the increase in terms of regulations from Part 135 to Part 129, uh, 21 adds cost, and uh, fuel prices accelerate the retirement. And we see a gap opening at the bottom in terms of airline service. And this is one of the markets that's the, a number of the developers are trying to address with their new electric aircraft. So if we look at aircraft deliveries, if we look at the, the very dark bottom part, this is a Bombardier chart from uh, 2009, but it shows the 20 to 39 seat market. And you see where the market's gone in terms of aircraft deliveries, it's gone to larger aircraft. People aren't building the smaller aircraft, which means that communities in a sense are losing service. Similarly, city pairs are migrating from uh, turboprop to regional jet, or in some cases regional jets were creating completely new city pairs, and the airlines were in a sense chasing the revenue of these larger markets. Now this was an interesting study I came across by Courtney Miller, who works for Bombardier, and I just came across it a couple, a couple weeks ago, and what he was saying that there was a market of $34 billion in short haul flying that has disappeared since 2000, if I'm reading his um, information right, that air traffic in the US has grown, but in the under 500 mile segment, it's actually shrunk. And this was quite surprising. But if you look at the factors that he identified, he identified airline consolidation, has led to a drop in short haul services. Pricing has increased disproportionately on short haul routes. Uh, and that's the, you know, the cost of operating the, the aircraft, the crew costs, wages are going up, other costs. And increased security requirements in the hassle factor have made alternative sh surface transportation more affordable. But if you have to go to the airport an hour and a half before, you have to wait in line, you, you know, and catch a, an Uber or a taxi at the other end, it might be cheaper and faster to drive the four hours rather than fly. Whereas the Dick Hensons in the 1960s were able to pull off people off the road and fly the short haul commuter. So this is an interesting thing. So a number of city pairs have lost service. And this is occurring all over the world. So the question is opportunity for electric aircraft. The manufacturers uh, cer certainly believe this is so. Now I happened to work at de Havilland in Toronto for many years and I was steeped in stall cult culture. So some of the presentations here were quite interesting. Uh, in terms of looking at an aircraft and infrastructure at the same time, Uber's doing a very good job in looking at the whole ecosystem, but it's been done before. When de Havilland launched the Dash 7, the promotion was city center airports. The idea that you could build a stall port on a dock or some land close to the city and bypass the main airports. The business model for this was Toronto City Centre Airport, or Toronto Island Airport, which is at the foot of Bathurst Street in Toronto, where I live today. And in the 1970s and 1980s, you had a number of carriers come in there and start flying short haul services to Montreal and to Ottawa and other cities. Uh, went through some changes but today, Toronto City Centre Airport uh, is served by about 32 Q400 aircraft. There's 2.5 million people going through the facility a year. And you can get off your plane and walk to downtown. I can take a streetcar to this airport or a bike 
or I'm sure soon a scooter. It's right downtown in the city. And here's a case where de Havilland was hoping to put this out to other cities around the world, and they were successful. London City Airport in, was built on the Docklands in East London. Ryman Airways was partially owned by de Havilland when they started service. London City has become a business destination for people from throughout Europe. And I believe there's even an A318 that flies transatlantic. And so there's an example of an aircraft concept which was originally premised around stall. The airport got bigger and they could use larger aircraft, but the aircraft and the infrastructure came together and you had a very successful example. Another thing that's taking place right now is the idea that if you want to go from downtown to downtown, often it's from the waterfront to the waterfront. It's not a new idea, it's an old idea. Uh, in the 1930s, you could fly from Vancouver to Victoria and to Seattle on a drag and repeat on floats. You know, and some of the very first Boeing aircraft service was between Seattle and Victoria moving mail. Uh, this is Vancouver Harbor in 1985 with a piston otter. Oops. This is Vancouver Harbor today at the Vancouver Harbor Flight Center, which is on the back of the Convention Center, which was the media center for the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver. That's the passenger terminal. That's the docks in Vancouver. Harbor Air moves 400,000 people a year off airport between Vancouver and Vancouver Island up to Whistler. People connect on a seaplane from Victoria to Vancouver Airport and onto a, a scheduled airline flight. So 400,000 people off airport, they're doing it today in Vancouver. Harbor Air, earlier this year with Magni, announced that they're going to become the world's first all-electric airline. They're going to convert it to Havilland Beaver to a 450 horsepower electric motor. The Beaver is a pretty strong aircraft. You can put the batteries in it. And they've been converted to various engines over the years. And once they perfected that, they replaced the PT-6 on their Otter fleet. They fly every half an hour between Vancouver and downtown Victoria, a 30-minute flight. They also have one of the shortest route networks in the world. So the issue of when you have a 15 to 30 minute flight of having a 30 minute reserve, you can do it within an hour. So they move 400,000 people a year. And then of course, down in Seattle, you have Harbor Air, not Harbor Air, uh, Kenmore Air, doing something very similar and complementary in terms of to the San Juan Islands. The third thing I noticed when I looked at the original Uber Elevate um, presentations is there's an echo here. Some of this has been done before, but one, what's the difference between yesterday and today? Helicopter airlines, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people a month were once flying in the US on helicopter airlines. You had New York Airways in 19, flying in New York, originally starting with airmail service, and an airmail subsidy, the concept being that helicopter airlines would evolve in the same way as airlines with a subsidy first and then reaching a critical mass in terms of traffic. That's the route network for New York Airways. In some cases, it looks very similar to what Uber or Lyft is doing. Oops, okay. Um, a friend of mine is preparing a website which will launch later this year, which is Helicopter Airline History. There's been over 150 helicopter airlines, but there's really only two in operation or three in operation today. This is Sabina Airlines. They actually flew to Paris in 1960. So this is a helicopter city to center, to city center air service. They had the infrastructure, the heliports. This is Chicago Helicopter Airways. They had both a mail, air mail route and the passenger route. The thin lines are the uh, helicopter routes, and they would do them sort of clockwise or counterclockwise. In some cases, there was over 30 stops on the network. And then the heavy black routes were the passenger routes. And this was LA Helicopter Airways, which started in 1947 with a Sikorsky S-51, and 
shut down in the late 60s, early 70s when they bought Twin Otters and went, became a stall service. Um, and they also had an infrastructure. In some ways, when you look at the Uber plans for LA, hey, this looks very similar to what was there before. Now, one of the things then with these airlines is the cost of aircraft acquisition in the 1950s was much less as a proportion of the carrier's revenue. If you bought an S-58, say, in Canada, you could pay for that aircraft in three operating seasons. Today, when you buy a helicopter, and as the helicopters became bigger and more complex, you had to pay. It took more, many more years to pay off the aircraft. Uh, these larger aircraft were... Uh, 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 up to 28 seats, so you had good seat mile costs. So the infrastructure was available before. In many cases, the infrastructure has disappeared. Um, the subsidies were cancelled in the mid-1960s by the U.S. government, and Chicago failed at that point. SFO was profitable between Oakland and San Francisco, but they sold their aircraft for a profit into the North Sea, the 61s. New York Airways had two crashes, Newark and downtown New York, which killed their operations, but operations continue with New York helicopter for another decade or more. So helicopter airlines were serving New York up until the mid-90s. New York Airways' Vertols went to Columbia Helicopters, became loggers. Trump's aircraft became helicopter loggers. This was New York Airways' uh, 61 showing up in Vancouver to become a logger. I bicycled up to the airport to see it. So exciting at the time. Um, and then when we look at high volume heliports, where were the high volume heliports? Well, there were a few scheduled services like Penzance, but when you look at high volume helicopter operations out of a heliport, it really was the flight seeing market that became the dominant for high volume. And I think that today, uh, Niagara Falls might be the highest tempo uh, with a small fleet. Their flights are seven minutes long, and so they're landing at right one aircraft after the other. When I hear about the kind of tempo that some of these uh, uh, urban air mobility operations have, uh, I have to say, well, how does that compare to a helicopter sightseeing operation? Can you really put that many aircraft in the air at the time? But that's, that's a separate thing. When we look at scheduled successful helicopter airlines, it happens that my hometown of Vancouver is the most successful. Helijet opened in 1986 in downtown Vancouver, a couple of months after this heliport floated into um, uh, that position where it is. It was walking distance to downtown, walking distance to um, uh, later to a subway, to a, a commuter ferry terminal, uh, the convention center is the building in the background behind. And on the top of that building to the left, there is a air traffic control tower for Vancouver Harbor, both for uh, fixed wing seaplanes and for helicopters. Without infrastructure, the ATC was put in place in the 70s. Yep. So S-76s flying Vancouver Victoria, Vancouver Nanaimo, and possibly they're looking at Vancouver Seattle as an international service. They did try Whistler as well. So success of this thing, what were the key ingredients for a successful urban air mobility service that's lasted for 30 year, two years? Well-matched city pairs. It happens that the city pairs are separated by water. Two, high traffic demand. Vancouver is the business center. Victoria is the government center. So a lot of city travel, alternate travel, 30 minutes downtown to downtown by helicopter or seaplane, or three hours minimum airport to airport or longer by ferry. Uh, and the infrastructure, heliports in the right place, critical to the operation. Also, fly neighborly. They fly these aircraft at 5,000 feet between Vancouver and Victoria, and they avoid flying over certain islands and they bury the route. And that has also meant that the community has been supportive of the services. But you can't catch an Uber in Vancouver, it's banned by the provincial government. So the Anyways, Helijet, they have their passengers flying, 100,000 passengers a year right now, flying on a scheduled helicopter, and the passengers are asking the president, Danny Sitton, who spoke at one of our recent conferences, can you get me the rest of the way home? So an aircraft like an eVTOL that could feed or connect with 
the existing trunk route offers potential to serve other areas in either the Vancouver or even the Seattle area where often the routes are separated by bridges or water. So when I look at the Uber thing, I say there are precedents. I mean, this is certainly scaling up from what's there before, but the fact that they're addressing both the infrastructure and the vehicle at the same time, based on the, what I've seen with the Haviland and Stahl and uh, helicopter airlines, is certainly the right way to go. The other thing that people forget is that we're having disruption coming next year in aviation. The AW609 tilt rotor is going to be certified later this year and enter service with ERA helicopters next year. It's not an airplane, it's not a helicopter, it's both. Or it's something beyond. And that raises the question, will the rising tide of eVTOL and what's happening on eVTOL spill over and help create infrastructure for this? Final point, the challenge of is emerging markets. Traditional aircraft manufacturers look at um, demand. If you're in the commercial airline industry, traffic grows by 4% a year. You know that uh, the market will double in terms of air travel in the next 25 years. And therefore, the demand for aircraft, new aircraft, whether it's Boeing or Airbus or Bombardier or others, is a combination of accommodating that growth in traffic plus replacing the aircraft that are retiring. That's how a traditional ma marketer will look at this activity. When a new generation propulsion system comes along, you have the opportunity to upgrade your technology. More recently, it's been the geared turbofan in uh, the airline market, but we have another propulsion revolution coming with electric, which offers uh, the opportunity to either re-engine, in the case of Harbor Air, or Ampere, or clean sheet design, where the aircraft design is optimized for the electric power plant. Sometimes an aviation market only appears when the new infrastructure and aviation technology emerge together. With the regional jet, when we were marketing the regional jet, most of there was a heavy pushback from turboprop airlines in the States. I worked for four years on the American Airlines campaign, and then they bought regional jets. But the initial pushback from American was, show us the markets, show us the revenue. We know what your aircraft can do, but we want the business case. And it had to be modeled. We modeled over 300 potential routes to determine which aircraft, which, which spokes out of each hub could support that aircraft. And then we had to show what kind of market share in terms of revenue we were pulling from the other airlines. So the business modeling uh, was very complex, um, but the market turned. Uh, the Leonardo 609, they're at that similar stage, or perhaps they're at a similar stage to the eVTOL industry, in that they have a completely new tool in the toolbox, which can do things that fixed wing and helicopter can't do. When you look at market forecasting, uh, this is, I'm just going to wrap up here. These are the things that traditional aircraft manufacturers look at. Market size and market distribution, the factors are the same. Uh, GDP, fuel prices, fuel, fuel fleet characteristics, access to aircraft financing, market liberalization, scope clauses in the case of regional airlines is an issue. It's not so much for eVTOL or for uh, the smaller end of the market. Environmental focus, we're seeing that, of course, much more now with, um, and, the, and it's in a sense driving electric, and then aviation infrastructure. Market share, who gets the business, whether it's an OEM, uh, which OEM gets the, the business, I mean, pricing, operating costs, competitors, productivity, speed range, cabin, availability, entrance, entry into service, you know, first mover in the market, trade barriers, technology. Traditional aircraft forecasts, this is for Bombardier, for example, but for others, based on air travel be cyclical and directly related to economic growth and wealth creation over the long term. There will be increased demand for emerging markets over the long term. Markets will continue their trend towards liberalization over the long term. Access to aircraft financing will not be a constraint over the long term. Port Two is very important when we talk about these emerging markets for electric. Aviation infrastructure will support air travel demand over the long term. In mature markets, infrastructure will support demand for air travel. In emerging markets, there will be a lag in growth. Now, the question about infrastructure is certainly for some of the proposals we have here for e and for anything that's off conventional airport or off 
potential heliport, that has to come in parallel. An increased environmental effect, the uh, focus will also affect the demand for the fleet. Uh, in wrapping up, uh, Vertical Flight Society has been involved in eVTOL since 2014. Our next event is uh, uh, in January 2020, Transformative Vertical Flight C Conference in San Jose. Uh, if you want to uh, take a deep dive into eVTOL, uh, please check out the website and uh, attend. Thank you.